our call to worship today from Psalm 92. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto his name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery and the harp with a solemn song. For thou, O Lord, has made us glad through thy work. We will triumph in the, in the works of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. Our scripture reading today is taken from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verses 1 to 14. Let us listen as we hear about God's promise to David. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, 
Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel? Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed your ruler of my people. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own, and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did in the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed you leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God for his holy word. Amen. Continuing, our next reading comes to us from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. We listen as we hear how the Jews and the Gentiles reconcile to Christ. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcised, Remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Jesus Christ, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens, with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as a chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen.
Now, O Lord, continue to inspire us by the might and power of your will, Holy Spirit. Renew our minds, O God, and cause us, O Lord, to meditate upon your word and to receive a message, O God, from you, O Lord, today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Today, we would have looked at two readings the first one being from 2 Samuel, verses 1 to 14. In this reading, David firstly begins by reflecting on how the Lord has blessed him with vast resources. That he has a house. And David is looking at the fact that he is thinking that God does not have a house. David is looking that the worship of God, especially through the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant being taken from place to place on the tents, and David being instrumental in the Ark of the Covenant being returned to Jerusalem, is thinking that God needs a house. So he says to his prophet Nathan, I think I will build God a house. And Nathan, being a man, being a human being, says, good idea. But later in the reading, Nathan moves from manly thought, from what a human would think, yes, David, go ahead and build this house, he is moved by God speaking to him and inspiring him. And David receives a message from God through Nathan that God is saying he doesn't really need a physical house. That David is led to understand that God through Nathan is saying, that if all along you have been moving me around in a tent, if God, and God is saying that if he wanted a physical temple, he would have said it to one of the leaders, one of the judges that he would have appointed to lead his people. So he's saying, I don't really need a physical house. I need to build up a house and if you, David, say you want to build a physical house, the Lord will reciprocate. The Lord will show that he has a vision beyond the understanding of a man, even a man as powerful, even a leader as David. He is saying through the prophet that he doesn't need this temple to be built now and to be built physically. Because as we would know, the temple was allowed to be built by God, but not by David, but by his son, Solomon. David is thinking of this physical house. God is thinking of his spiritual house. And God revealed, just as David wanted to build that house, that God is establishing and God established the house of David. So he says, yes, you will have this house. It will be the house of David. The descendants of the descendants of this house will establish God's kingdom. So the concept of a physical house is moved to a temple and then a dynasty, an empire that never ends. That Jesus Christ descended from the house of David, that God gave him all power in heaven and earth and all authority to execute judgment, that he will build a gospel temple, a temple based on the word of God, a house fit for God, for his name, a spiritual temple for all believers. It is the dimension of God's plan under God's action as opposed to David 
a man's plan and a man's action. God's vision for mankind compared to man's vision. David could only see the physical need for a house for the Lord. God sees our spiritual needs and he provided for, the, for them from that point onwards to allow the house of David to be built. And why are we speaking of this today? Why are we speaking today of a physical temple? We think of the fact that we are not allowed into a physical church. We think that the pandemic is confining us to worship God from wherever we are. And if we ask ourselves the question, do we need a physical temple, a physical building to worship the Lord? This COVID pandemic has led us to the answer, no. All we need is to see God in ourselves, in our lives, in our homes, to speak to him, to pray to him, to worship him through Christ Jesus, wherever we are. Do we need a physical temple? You know, for some of us, the answer is yes. And we agree with you because for many of us, our main social event to come out the house, to put on a nice clothes and to come and meet people and to smile and to laugh and to talk, to listen to a choir, to listen to the reverend, is to come to church. For some of us, the joy of being in a congregation with other believers for corporate worship is such a joy that we miss this. But we must look at the lesson coming out of this COVID, and we must look at the lesson that David had to learn that God doesn't need a physical temple. We do not know when churches would reopen. We do not know where we are ranked in importance. We see construction of buildings. We see that being allowed. But this, those people cannot build that building virtually, spiritually, without physically being there. We, because we are blessed by a Lord God living with a spirit in us, a Holy Spirit, we do not require to be physically on a construction site to build upon what God has given us. We are allowed to construct our lives because of the teaching of Christ Jesus and because of his death and because of his resurrection. When we see that we do not know when churches would be open, we do not need to be in a physical building to wash our souls because Jesus has already died for our sins. We know that we are ranked somewhere below laundromats but people cannot wash those clothes spiritually. We can wash away, and Christ washes away our every sin from right where you sit. And therefore, do we need a physical temple? No. We could reflect that without being in a physical church, we are connected virtually by electronic means that we worship God, that his Holy Spirit transcends every boundary, every wall, every electric wire, every airwave that it takes that it, to, for this message to reach us. God has overcome all that for us because he speaks to us in our mind. Because even as you are here in this message, God is speaking to you and aligning your thought and your condition with what he is allowing you to hear. We continue in the absence of a physical church to confess to God, to seek Jesus, to praise him, to honor him, and to give him glory. Yes, we would enjoy coming back to physical church, but God expects us to praise him, to continue in worship, to continue to do good, to reach out to his needy people, 
to behave as good Christians, to read His Word, to pray, to fast. Because regardless of where we are, He hears us and forgives us, blesses us, heals us, protects us, answers our prayer wherever we are. He did not need a physical church, a physical temple, the day when David was thinking to build it for him. He has us now, and we are the temples of God. He is the one true and living God, omnipresent, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, in our hearts today, in our minds, and in our homes. When we look at the reading from Ephesians, it really brings into context how we must approach our lives as temples of God. So God, at the time of David, did not, and in the reading in 2 Samuel, did not need a physical temple, and he said if he needed it, he would have said so. Now today, in the reading from Ephesians, especially verses 19 to 22, the church is likened to a house with every believer, every one of us, as a member of the family of God. Every member is both a child of the household and a servant of the household. Now think about that. How could you be a child and a servant at the same time? Well, we are children of God. You are a child in the household of God who just has to look up to God as your holy father, as Christ, as your provider, as your savior, as your redeemer, as the Holy Spirit, as your wisdom and your guide, and say, I am a child and I need you. You are a child of God, and you are a child as a member of the household of God. But you are also required to be a servant. And we're not speaking here of child labor. We speak now that once we are members of the household of God, we become servants of God. So we serve him through prayer, through worship, through adoration. We serve him by being obedient to him. We serve him by when we hear his word and his calling in our lives, we obey. We pick up ourselves and we say, yes, Lord. In the reading, 19 to 22, the church is seen as a building. The teachings of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the doctrines, is seen as the foundation. The foundation as prophesied in the Old Testament. Believers are seen as the very stones with which the heavenly temple is being built. Jesus is defined, is said, and is identified as the chief cornerstone. This temple is not a physical temple. This temple is the spiritual temple that God has built and provided for us with Jesus as the head, Jesus as the cornerstone. We, as members of the church, as believers, as children, and as servants, and building blocks. You know how you become a building block? Today in your home, after the service, when you call up your friend, your relative, your daughter, your son, your parent, and you share with them God's word, and you tell them what you are doing for the Lord today and tomorrow and Tuesday when you see someone looking for a box of food and a hamper. You continue to build God's work. Because in the Lord, in the closing verse, we are being built together to become a dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Let us desire his presence in our lives and in our homes. Let us desire his influence and his might and power over our very minds and our very hearts. 
that we will seek to do what he wants us to do for his glory in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen my hope is built on nothing less than jesus blood and righteousness i dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in jesus name blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus name Christ Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you glory, honor, and praise for your message today, that we come to him, as in 1 Peter 2.4, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. We ourselves, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to offer spiritual sacrifices accepted to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in the scripture, Behold, you are laying, O God, in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whosoever believes in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ, will not be put to shame. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think, according to the power of his work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.